Everyone charged with a penal offense has the right to be presumed innocent until proved guilty according to law in a public trial at which he has had all the guarantees necessary for his defense. No one shall be held guilty of any penal offense on account of any act or omission which did not constitute a penal offense under national or international law at the time when it was committed. Nor shall a heavier penalty be imposed than the one that was applicable at the time the penal offense was committed. What's important about the presumption of innocence is that you cannot trust the state. There is a great deal of suspicion reflected here about whether the state can be relied upon to prosecute people properly. And in particular, the presumption of innocence emphasizes the trial as opposed to the preliminary investigation by the prosecution or the procuror of Eastern Europe. So the idea is that you cannot assume when the trial begins that the suspect is guilty. And the presumption of innocence tells you, no, you have to have a trial on the basis of a clean slate. You can't make any assumptions. This is definitely a 20th century idea. There's no recognition of this idea before uh, contemporary uh, legal thought. And basically it is a reflection of suspicion toward the reliability of the state. You cannot trust the state. You need several checks against the possibility of convicting innocent people. That's the first idea. The second idea, in the second part, is what's called nulla puina sine lege, or no crime without legislative prohibition. That also is absent in the American Constitution. But the reason for it in the 20th century is that we recognize diversity among the legal cultures of the world. And because there's so much diversity, people have different ideas of what's automatically criminal, what should be punished. And there's no way you can assume that citizens know what is right and wrong and what's going to be punished. So therefore, you have to tell them in advance. And the only way to make sure that they know in advance is to require a legislative definition. The, de the, the statute has to tell you in clear and plain language when you're doing something that might trigger criminal punishment. No one shall be subjected to arbitrary interference with his privacy, family, home, or correspondence, nor to attacks upon his honor and reputation. Everyone has the right to the protection of the law against such interference or attacks. It's about giving us space, space to be by ourselves, to do things that we would never do in public, to act out fantasies, to play, to tease, to be foolish in ways that we would never be if we knew someone was watching us. It's about standing around in your room and singing to a song. It's about pretending to be a favorite actor. It's about teasing one's partner in ways that you just would never do unless, unless you knew you were really alone. What do you have to hide? Why do you have to keep a, a private person which is different from your public? Why not transparency? All those questions put, cast a shadow on the very value of privacy. So what's so great about privacy? And my answer is that what's so great about privacy is that privacy is really what enables us to have the most meaningful relations that we have. Namely, privacy is a condition for intimacy. And without privacy, there are no, no friendship, no sharing secrets, no sharing intimate and inner thoughts, and no discriminatory relations, namely forming relations, thick relations, that we care about, mainly family relations and friendships. Everyone has the right to freedom of movement and residence within the borders of each state. Everyone has the right to leave any country, including his own, and to return to his country. A great idea, freedom of movement, but then if it's uh, such a good idea, why should uh, we not allow people the right to move freely without uh, restrictions also on the international level? I mean, uh, I think one of the most uh, 
important philosophical challenges to the idea of freedom of movement is to show why the national borders are in any sense relevant to the application of the right. Why should people, as the declaration itself says, have a full right to free movement within national borders, but somewhat restricted the rights on the international level? Uh, I think it has to do especially with the uh, issue which uh, was not uh, uh, very high on the agenda in, in 1948, and that's Im immigration and the uh, movement of people between one country and the other. It says that people may uh, uh, should have the right to leave the country and to return to their country, but, the, but it doesn't say anything about the duty of other countries to accept or let people who decide to move uh, into uh, uh, countries which are not originally theirs. Everyone has the right to seek and to enjoy in other countries asylum from persecution. This right may not be invoked in the case of prosecutions genuinely arising from non-political crimes or from acts contrary to the purposes and principles of the United Nations. Um, I think that it's really important to have a place to go to because, well, if you don't, it's kind of hard to be yourself and, you know, you can go crazy if you're being chased after, kind of. So sometimes you just have to stop and take a breath. It's kind of like when you're playing tag and, you know, you have bass and so when you get really tired, you run to bass and that's it, no one can chase you. So you just kind of have to feel safe and everybody needs to stop and take a breath and that's kind of important because you need you really need to feel safe and everyone has a right to. Everyone has a right to a nationality. No one shall be arbitrarily deprived of his nationality, nor denied the right to change his nationality. I don't feel particularly British or English. I feel European. And living here in America has made me feel more European than ever. Um, not that I don't share a lot of things with my American friends, but I'm not in some way, the essence of me is not the same as the essence of them. I don't know if that's nationality or not. But I know, for example, that my reactions to things are tempered by a whole different culture. A different culture, a different background. I'm not sure what nationhood means. I guess it's one of those all-encompassing words like cuisine where we all have to eat, but we don't all eat the same things. Everyone has to feed themselves, but we don't all do it in the same way. And it doesn't mean that one, one particular nation's cuisine or one region's cuisine, just because it's different, is any better or worse than anybody else's. It's a common, something we all have in common. Men and women of full age, without any limitation due to race, nationality or religion, have the right to marry and to found a family. They are entitled to equal rights as to marriage, during marriage and at its dissolution. Marriage should be entered into only with the free and full consent of the future spouses. The family is the natural and fundamental group unit of society and is entitled to protection by society and the state. But if we deeply care about the future, we care about the future because we care about people living in a certain way, namely in a way that we consider valuable. So children are a promise that they um, continue a way of life which 
um, they have learned to cherish by the good example of um, the of people whom with whom they um, have been brought up, who looked after them and so forth. This is not to say, of course, that uh, uh, people pe that you know that that one that one doesn't doesn't respect the autonomy of uh, people in making their own decisions. But the autonomy and the value of the autonomy of people making their own decisions, both about how they want to go about, about their individual lives and about how they want to structure the social life collectively, the value of, the, of, of people's autonomy is itself, of course, um, a constitutive element of a particular understanding what is important about um, um, people's lives. Everyone has the right to own property, alone as well as in association with others. No one shall be arbitrarily deprived of his property. We often take property rights for granted until it's taken away or made inaccessible. Everyone should have a right to own property, a place to call home, an extension of their personal equity, a symbol of their hard work. Without that access, their self-worth and their ambition can be compromised.